Good morning, Faith Church. I'm so thankful that you are here this morning. Our teaching text is Hebrews chapter 4. It'll be page 831, the Pew Bible directly in front of you. Page 831, Hebrews chapter 4. In just a moment, we're going to read Hebrews 4 in its entirety together. So that we can understand more what God the Holy Spirit said through his writer to the church a long time ago. Because the message that he spoke a long time ago is the message that he has for all of us today. Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to focus on the first 11 verses, even though we're going to read the whole chapter. Before we pray, before we read this text, I want to invite you to pray with me. We need to center our hearts on prayer. There's so many things on our minds, on our hearts, things that are happening in the room, things that are happening in our life, things that we need to do when we get out of here, what we're going to have for lunch. We just need a moment to sit in God's presence, asking the Lord to speak through his words. Will you pray with me before we read Hebrews 4? Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for the invitation to know you. I pray, Lord, that we rest in you today. Teach us the Sabbath well. For those who are outside of your grace, those who are not outside of your grace, but they're not in the family, they're not followers of you, living life in perpetual chaos and anxiety, I pray that you give rest, that you give Sabbath today. Once you speak through the message, hide me behind your cross and proclaim powerfully to these dear people that are gathered in your name for such a time as this. Would you speak to us through your word? We pray and ask these things and give you glory for what you're going to accomplish today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hebrews chapter 4, begin reading with me in verse 1. The writer says this, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Verse 4. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and to those whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account." Seeing then we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. May the Lord add his richest blessing to the reading of his word. The title of the message this morning is Sabbath Rest, God's Antidote for Our Anxiety. Sabbath Rest, God's Antidote for Our Anxiety. We wrap up our series on emotional, healthy spirituality this morning with this sermon on Sabbath 
rest. This February, a Time Magazine article described our current time period as the time of the great exhaustion. The writer of that article said this, we know that we are tired and we see it in the choices that we make every day ordering dinner because we don't have the energy to make it, trying to find ways to work from home so we don't have to add a two-hour commute to our day, infrequent social outings because it's impossible to coordinate busy adult schedules, complete deprioritization of hobbies, the list goes on and on. If I were to ask you by way of show of hands this morning, who among us is tired? I expect that many of your hands just did go up. We are all tired and we desperately need rest. That's become conceptualized in a different way as a parent of a newborn. We need more than a good nap though, brothers and sisters. We are actually longing for something more. We are longing for a better kind of rest. We're longing for God himself. We're longing for God's presence. And we desperately need Sabbath rest. God's word is not silent about the subject of rest, as we'll discover in our journey through Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, there are three categories, types, examples of rest. Three types of rest that we see in Hebrews 4, which will serve as a foundation for actually equipping you and me to start practicing the Sabbath the way that God intended for us to do so. Notice with me the first type of rest, a rest of deliverance, a rest of deliverance. We actually have to go back to chapter 3 to pick up on this. The paragraph divisions in our Bibles, the punctuation marks, those are interpretive based on the translation philosophy of your Bible translation. So sometimes we need to go back a little bit in order to understand what's happening. A rest of deliverance, chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. I'm going to read those because we didn't read those in our first reading. A rest of deliverance. The word of the Lord says, For who, having heard, rebelled, indeed, was not at all who came out of Egypt led by Moses. Now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who did not obey? A rest of deliverance. The writer wanted his audience to think back to the time God delivered his people from Egyptian oppression under the leadership of Moses and Joshua. If you want to know more about how God's people became slaves in the first place, you need to brush up on the Joseph narrative. Genesis concludes with Joseph dying, making a special request to the people of God that they would carry his bones into the land of promise. Can you imagine? They had to carry his bones into the land of promise, no matter how long it would take them to get there. Little did they know they would be carrying those bones for 40 years. So that's where Genesis ends. Exodus picks up on that narrative. In Exodus chapter 1, there's a new Pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph, never heard anything about Joseph, even though he used to work for the Pharaoh, right? There's a new Pharaoh in town, and he doesn't know anything about Joseph. What begins to happen is Joseph's family lives in Egypt, and they begin to multiply such that the population of the Hebrew people exceeded that of the Egyptians. So the Pharaoh said, I'm going to make these people my slaves. I'm going to get some cheap labor out of these guys. And so he was a very bad Pharaoh. He began to oppress the people of God and he caused them to labor. He in fact demanded that they make bricks without even providing adequate supplies for those bricks. That is the direct context that the writer of Hebrews chapter 3 and verse and chapter 4 has in mind. There were people who were promised 
the promised land, Canaan land. They're going to get out of Egypt. God told Moses, go and get my people. And then he would raise up a young leader, Joshua, to serve after Moses. And yet, not all actually entered the land of promise. In fact, the majority of the people only made it to the border of the promised land. They never were able to walk in, including Moses himself. Because of why? Unbelief. There were two men among 12 spies. 12 spies were sent to the land of Canaan to go and spy out the land and see how it was. 10 of those 12 reported back to everyone, there are some crazy things, there are crazy creatures, and the people are large there. I'm afraid of them. And the mood of all the people was swayed by the 10 negative spies. It's another sermon for another time. But there were two of the spies that went in and actually spoke for God. Their names were Joshua And Caleb. One thing the Bible says about Caleb is that there was a spirit in Caleb that was different than all the rest. If I ever have a son, I want to name him Caleb. Probably won't happen because now I've told you the name, right? We have to protect that. Why is that? Because Caleb had a different spirit. He came back to the people of God and he said, you know what? There is some crazy things out there, but the Lord, our God said he was going to fight for us back in Exodus 14, 14. So we're going to go into the promised land and we're going to take rightful ownership of what the Lord has given us. And even Moses, the leader, the shepherd of God's people, their pastor, if you will, was not permitted to enter the land of promise. Why? He did not belief. He did not believe that Yahweh God was going to deliver his people and follow through on his promises. So we see the first type of rest here described as we get into chapter four, a rest of deliverance. And the Egyptian rescue, the rescue of God rescuing his people through the Exodus narrative is so important as we understand the whole narrative of the Bible. Everything after the Exodus gets interpreted in light of it. Well, we're not living under a Pharaoh. We're not slaves, at least in the sense that the Hebrew people were. And yet we are indeed slaves of sin. We're not making bricks for a bad Pharaoh. We live in the United States of America. We are a free people. Yet, we overlook the slavery of sin. And the first kind of rest that God offers is a rest of deliverance. Jesus came to free the captives, to proclaim liberty to those in captivity to give sight to the blind, and to raise the dead. We are all born as slaves of sin because we are in union with Adam and Eve, who first rebelled against God's plan, willfully sinning, rejecting God's goodness. The first kind of rest God offers us is a deliverance of sin through Jesus. And the message, you're going to hear me use words like rest, You're going to hear me use words like Sabbath. I want to submit to you this morning, if you're hearing the sound of my voice, watching online or wherever you may be, and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, all of your pushing for rest is going to be vanity, as the writer of Ecclesiastes says. The first rest that you are invited to experience is that rest of deliverance. And whether you realize it or not, if you're not a born-again Christian, following Jesus, walking in His way, trusting in His path, doing His deeds, you're not a disciple. And the first rest that He offers you is rest of deliverance, which is symbolic of our eternal life and our salvation that we have in Jesus. If you don't go to Jesus and recognize that he is the one who delivers you, you're going to go to all these other people and avenues. And what you're going to find is they're all empty wells. I think about those who have won numerous Super Bowls, who have the rings to show for. They climbed the top of the success mountain and they got there and nothing. Because our hearts 
We're made for more. And if you're here and you have not been set free from sin, the Lord Jesus wants to rescue you today. All you have to do is take his hand, believe through faith. There is the rest of deliverance. There's also a second kind of rest that we see as we read this passage, a divine rest. Chapter four and verse four. So the first was a rest of deliverance. Now we're looking at a divine rest. It's fascinating that the writer of Hebrews doesn't start with God resting on the seventh day. That would have been where I would have started if I would have been the person writing Hebrews 4. Why does he start here where he does? Chapter 4 and verse 4, he has spoken a certain place of the seventh day in this way. God rested on the seventh day from all his work. God made a pronouncement about setting the seventh day aside and making it holy. Of all the Ten Commandments, none get the treatment that Sabbath does. God wanted his people to recognize the beauty of Sabbath. He wanted his people to keep the Sabbath, though he never intended for Sabbath keeping to be another ritual. God intends for both humans and animals to have a rhythm, a routine that incorporates meaningful rest. The divine rest that Hebrews 4.4 describes to us as compelling and exemplary. When we choose to partake in the Sabbath, when we choose to set aside all of our work to worship God, delight in God, enjoy His creation, and delight in other people, Sometimes Pete Pete Scazzaro, the writer of our book, would say, play. We think about play as an activity relegated only to children. But God has designed the Sabbath as a day of renewal and restoration. As Christians, we celebrate Sabbath every Sunday when we gather here and worship the risen Jesus. But I'm not so foolish to believe that Sunday is actually a Sabbath for all of you. There are some of us who have to still work on Sundays. There are those that work in public safety and they have to work on Sundays. There are those who are nurses. There are those who are in the military and they have to work on Sunday. And other professions are being added to that. Our country was started on Christian principles, though it's arguable whether or not it was actually founded as a Christian nation. Founded on biblical principles but not necessarily meaning directly that we're started as a Bible-believing, Jesus is the only way to heaven nation. So when our country was started, it was built into the fabric of our nation that Sunday was a day of rest because that's the resurrection day. That's when people worship. That's when we Sabbath. And as time goes on, you're going to see less and less protection for Sundays. Sometimes I feel bad when we go to restaurants on Sundays, though I enjoy the meal that I'm going to have or whatever the situation is that those people are having to labor on Sabbath. Again, it's not intended to be a legalistic, ritualistic checkbox. In fact, by the time of Jesus, there was a a writing called the Mishnah, the Mishnah. In the Mishnah, there was all this articulation about the Sabbath where they basically added on to God's law. And it was so ridiculous that the Lord Jesus is walking through the grain field one day. His disciples pluck off some weed and begin to eat that. And the religious people lose their minds. They're working on the Sabbath. They broke that, and now they're getting that little seed out to get the wheat. They're working on the Sabbath. God gave us the Sabbath as something that's good for us, not as a burden. But we see God himself, God of all creation, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, wise. Hebrews 4.4, 4, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. When we Sabbath, we are saying no to our self-control. We're saying yes to God's sovereignty and yes to God's goodness. When we Sabbath, we're saying I have limits and it's okay. The world's going to carry on just fine without me. There is a rest of deliverance. There is a divine rest that the Lord, our creator, modeled himself. And then there is a third type of rest that I believe we see right here in Hebrews 4, and that is a desirable rest. 
This is the one that excites us. This is the rest that we long for when Jesus returns, when all the wrongs are made right, when the curse of sin is removed, Revelation 22, when there will be no more cancer burden, no more crying, no more sadness, no more tears, no more broken families. That day of rest is what we long for. And I don't know about you, but I came to faith in Jesus with a message that was something like this. Hell is real. You need to hurry up and believe in Jesus so you can die and go to heaven. I thank God for the faithfulness of those people who got involved in my life as a bus kid and shared the gospel that I was separated from Christ. Brothers and sisters, we are not saved, though, to wait on heaven. Furthermore, Heaven's not going to just be a glorious long nap. The Lord God gave Adam responsibility, which we still have. And I believe that we'll still have responsibility in the new heaven and the new earth. It'll be different. We no longer will have to toil by the sweat of our brow, which if you've done anything outside in Southwest Indiana in the last few days, you have toiled by the sweat of your brow. Went outside the other day. We have an above ground pool in our backyard and just went out there for a minute to use the skimmer net and kind of clean up a little bit from the tree and the rain and stuff like that. Soaking wet. I'm just pouring and I usually don't do that. By the sweat of our brow, it is a curse from Adam's fall, but work is not. We're not going to just take a glorious long nap in heaven. We're not going to be sitting there playing harps all the time. We will have, I believe, responsibility in heaven. It just won't be by the sweat of our brow anymore. There is a rest that is coming for the people of God. The Word of God says, and I'm getting this from chapter 4, verse 1, and then verses 9 through 11. There remains, therefore, verse 9, a rest for the people of God. What's that talking about? That's talking about the kind of rest we'll realize when Jesus' kingdom is fully established on earth. By the way, we think a lot about going to heaven when we die. Biblically, it seems like all things are going to be made new. There's going to be new heaven and a new earth. There is a great day coming for the people of God. We used to sing a song, there's a great day coming, a great day coming. But you know what? There's also a sad, terrible, and frightening day coming. Because there are those who are outside of Christ, who've never professed faith in Jesus, who are not following Jesus, who don't know God. They're not going to enter into eternal rest. You know, when you read obituaries, everyone dies and goes to heaven in our culture. Though this is not a popular message, I don't mean this in an unloving way at all. It is not everybody dying and going to heaven. It's not all paths, all religions leading their way to God. It is faith in Jesus Christ alone that results in eternal life. And those who are outside of Christ will not experience that rest. They'll experience eternal condemnation. But Jesus is inviting you today. You don't have to be outside the gate. You can be brought in today, right now, into his family and experience that forever rest. Why do these three types of rest that we see in Hebrews 4 relate to us? How do they resonate with us? Remember, we have the rest of deliverance. We have a divine rest, and then we have a desirable rest. They relate to us because we're born in sin and we need to be rescued They resonate with us because we're not limitless. God rested on the seventh day and made it holy. We're not the energizer bunny. We need Sabbath. And it resonates with us because we long for eternal peace. We long for shalom that was broken in the Garden of Eden. So what will it look like for us to begin experiencing Sabbath rest? How do we begin to prioritize Sabbath rest here on the earth while we're waiting for the day that Paul described in Romans 8 that the whole creation yearns with eager expectation just like a woman in labor. How do we begin to practice and prioritize Sabbath and why does it matter? We'll start with why it matters. We've been in a series on emotional, healthy spirituality. I submit to you that one reason that we are emotionally and spiritually unhealthy and immature is that we never practice Sabbath. We come to church, we rush away, we turn on our favorite sports team, and that's 
has its time and its place, but that's not what God has for Sabbath. Did you know you can go to the park with your family in Sabbath? You can read God's word under a shade tree, of course. Sabbath was meant for so much more than hurry up, let's go to church. Hurry up, whoever's preaching, Pastor Daniel, Pastor Eric, Pastor Dustin, let's hurry up and get out of here. We got to go, 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 go. Nope. Why do you think we have so many people that are struggling with uh, cardiac arrest, heart issues? Our refusal to live God, live life according to God's rhythm is actually killing us. We need Sabbath. We need God. So what does that look like? What are some applications for us? Number one, start with awareness. Start with awareness. God made the Sabbath. It was to be holy and we don't keep it holy. Start with awareness. Number two, recognize the unique challenges posed to us as people of the 21st century in practicing Sabbath. Let me say that another way. There are unique challenges that you and I face that are unique, not different, but to our time and space. Let me illustrate it this way. The Industrial Revolution began in 1733 about and ended about 1913, 18th century into the 20th century. There are many improve, helpful improvements in technology and medicine. We cannot and should not desire to go back to a time before the Industrial Revolution. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful the air conditioning's working this morning. Can you imagine what modern medicine would look like with the absence of the Industrial Revolution, light bulbs, energy? It'd be a totally different thing. The Industrial Revolution improved our lives, but it also brought great stress with it. Now we not only have the light bulb that was invented to give us light to be able to see, we have screens that we're constantly exposed to blue light. And there have been studies after study after study on how blue light, our phones, our computers, it actually keeps your brain going, 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 going. And what this is creating in our teenagers is an excessively high teen suicide and depression rate. Because they're always on their phone, always on their phone. And we've modeled that for them. We're never turning it off. God doesn't intend for us to keep living this way from chaos to chaos. He wants to offer rest. Number one, start with awareness. Number two, recognize the challenges that we deal with. Number three, explore what the Bible says about Sabbath. There are too many verses for me to articulate them all this morning. But it's fascinating. Look at what the scripture says about Sabbath rest. Number four, look at Christians, how they practice the Sabbath in church history. Read about what have Christians typically done? Oh, they sing hymns and they read the Bible and they pray. What is it that God is calling us to do in light of how believers in the past have lived? Number five, this is the most, I think the most important of all the application points. Give yourself grace I don't know about you, but if it's about spiritual disciplines or anything that God's words call me to do and change in my life, we all do this where we want to hurry up and we want to do it all at one time and we overcommit ourselves and we want to practice Sabbath. So we're like, we're not going to do anything for 24 hours. And then next week we fail. So we never go back to it again. Give yourself grace. Number five, we will not just fall into Sabbath keeping just like we don't fall into it evangelism. We won't get it right. We'll mess it up. And that's why we need a Sabbath with other Christians. That's part of what we're doing here on Sunday morning. It's not just because we like hearing ourselves talk. We're here because our souls are tired. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's life for a look at the Savior. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and experience the rest that he offers. What are some barriers that we actually experience to practicing Sabbath rest? What are the barriers to Sabbath rest? An inability to let go. We can't let go. 
We think we have control. We refuse to trust God's sovereignty and goodness. And choosing to enjoy Sabbath means that we're going to have to say no in order to have more powerful yeses. We have barriers, inability to let go of control. I already mentioned this, overstimulation through social media. And then not actually having a relationship with God as a barrier to experiencing the rest that he offers. You'll always feel like there's an empty hole if you don't know the Lord. Our text is all about the relationship between believing in Jesus and experience the rest and salvation he offers to all who trust him. One writer of a commentary says this, those who enjoy his rest will be believers, those who have approached God through Jesus Christ. You're never going to experience rest as long as you're outside of Christ. The thing is, though, not everyone's going to experience that rest. You can't enjoy the fullness of God's peace if you don't know God. And there's no substitute for genuine Sabbath and rest with God. God is offering you his rest right now, church. You don't have to wait until heaven to experience God's rest, though there is a rest coming that is far greater than any that we've experienced on this side of heaven. What a day, glorious day that'll be. When our Jesus we shall see, we will look upon his face, the one who saved us by his grace. What a day, glorious day that will be. We must repent from ignoring God's rhythm for our lives. One additional application for you. Pick time this week to Sabbath. Now, I hope you would have some Sabbath time today. That's not going to be feasible for those who are driving kids to camp. It's not going to be feasible for those who have to go to work. I want you to talk with your spouse. Look at your calendar. And I want you to figure out, you know what? If you can't give 24 hours to read the Bible, pray, sing hymns, listen to worship music, whatever that looks like for you, find one hour this week. Maybe you don't have a 24-hour period. I think for my life and my family, as we're praying about this together, what in the world does Sabbath look like when you have a newborn? I don't have that figured out for you yet. I need this. My soul is weary and tired, and I have to keep reminding myself to go back to His presence daily for that regular Sabbath. Here's the point. Look for those many Sabbaths whenever they present themselves. Capitalize on those moments. For me... It tends to be in the morning time. My favorite time of the morning is right before my wife and my daughter are both awake at the same time and my house is quiet. Now, some days, I'm going to just be honest with you. I work second shift 911 dispatch. That means I get off at 1045. Sometimes I'm not having that quiet time with God at five o'clock in the morning when it's time for Tallulah to eat. Sometimes I have to come back and do it later, three o'clock in the afternoon. Sometimes I have to do it on my way to work. That's the real world. So many preach about you need to have Sabbath. You need to do this. You need to do that. But they give you all these things that are not even relevant for real people who have real jobs and real commitments. But I want you to think about, is there a time space that you have in your your slot that you can give God an hour more of yourself and your family than you did last week? As much Netflix and social media as we consume, I think we can find an hour to give to the one who died for us. St. Augustine said, Our hearts are restless until they rest in God. Our hearts are restless and we long for the shalom, the peaceful paradise that we once had in Eden. And we'll spend our whole lives trying to find that peaceful paradise from Eden. But we're looking everywhere outside of Jesus. When we do not fill ourselves with God and His truth, we'll be more empty and exhausted than when We started, God doesn't want us to keep living this way. The Lord Jesus invites all of us, according to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Perhaps you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord. What he's inviting you to do is to run to him and experience the rest for your soul for the first time, knowing that you have a new name written in glory when you trust Christ. For those who do know Christ, perhaps you've been burdened by life, by the cares of this world. Jesus is inviting you today to come lay those burdens down. 
at his feet and rest in the peace that he provides. He says, I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Will you pray with me? Lord, we live in a dry and weary land where there is no water. We're tired. And yet we remind ourselves that it was your grace that brought us safe thus far. And it is your grace that will lead us home. We long for that day when you return, Lord, and we experience Sabbath forever, perpetual eternity. But until that day, teach us to rest in God. Teach us to rest in your kindness and your grace and your love. Knowing that you have the whole world in your hands. And you know the very hairs that we have on our head. You invite us to come to you today and rest. I pray for that burdened soul under the sound of my voice. The burden is so heavy they don't even know how to express it in words. That they will come to the altar and pray. Recognizing that you are the one who lifts up the countenance of our face. You invite us to come, Lord. What a friend we have in you. Thank you for the rest you offer. I pray for these dear people. Protect them from chaos. Protect them from the, the lies of the enemy that tell us that we have to do, do, do. Help us to focus on being your children. We love you and praise you for today. Speak, Lord, your servants are indeed listening. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand with us for a time of response.